Hey friends, this week on the show, a fantastic episode for you, a guy that I've been waiting for a while to get on the show. I've followed him and watched his journey unfold on social media and friends for a bit. Uh, my guest is Brantley Rutz, and when I say he was a dyed-in-the-wool Protestant, I mean dyed-in-the-wool. I mean, this guy and his wife named one of their kids Spurgeon, after the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon. They were that deep into the whole thing. And so what caused a dyed-in-the-wool Protestant, evangelical, a Baptist, to move from, well, Protestantism deep into the arms of the Catholic Church? What was it that drew him and his wife in? Well, it began with infant baptism and looking into the roots of their belief, uh, whether or not they should baptize their children, sitting on the cusp of that. And well, that research just led them deeper and deeper and more and more questions and eventually into full communion with the Catholic Church. And this is their journey. <laughs> Excuse me. This is their journey. And it's an awesome one. Please watch, please share this video with people that you think might be impacted and empowered by this message and this journey. It's a great one. Please interact below, like the video, subscribe, do all those fun things, and please help grow this channel. And thank you for watching. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcast, thank you. If you are on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, just press pause and leave a rating or a review because that helps to push the podcast out to more people and get messages like this one, interviews like this one, which is going to be amazing to more and more listeners. So thank you. Thanks for listening, guys. If you are watching on YouTube, hi, thanks. Subscribe, hit the bell, do all those fun YouTubey things and uh, interact in the comments. Uh, it's always a fun place, those comments, Brantley. I'm sure you know this, too. Uh, keep it nice, uh, or try to, and, and thanks for watching, guys, on uh, YouTube as well. And hey, if you aren't watching and you aren't subscribed, go over to YouTube and please do subscribe because we want to try to and grow this channel as best we can and reach more people with these kinds of conversations. I am joined this week, guys, uh, fantastic guest, uh, Brantley Rutt. He is a convert to the Catholic faith, born and raised in Alabama. He is a husband, the father to six kids, and he is my guest this week. Uh, Brantley, I am thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you for being here, and hello. Keith, hello. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. I can't personally promise that it's going to be amazing, but I, I will do my best. I, <laughs> I okay, okay. If you can, I can. I'm sure it's gonna be an awesome Perfect. episode. Look, I, I have we connected at some point. I don't know when we couldn't figure this out before I, I the show either. We tried to talking briefly about this, Brantley, but I don't know when we first connected. But I followed you for a while. Uh, one of those guys who's kind of been in my Catholic convert orbit, and I've kind of watched your journey unfold and watched you asking questions and seen you interacting with other people on different kind of questions and and back and forths. Uh, you you have always been very cordial in the interactions that, that I have seen. So a perfect guest for this show, Brantley. And uh, I wanted to in invite you on as soon as I can, as soon as I could. You've been busy having kids, and, and we have been too. You've had more kids in a shorter time than we've had, though. You just had twins, went from, you said, four to six in one kind of foul swoop. <laughs> so that's awesome. But I'm so thrilled you can make time for us and, and join us to talk about your conversion story because I, I think it's a good one. I mean, I, I watched questions you were wrestling with, and th those are questions that resonated so deeply with me and many listeners to this show and people who have had on this show in the past. They're, they're very similar questions and the kind of questions that you wrestle with in, in these journeys. So I am so pleased to have you tell your story. Uh, I, I sound like... Uh, I'm terrible, Brantley. I, I'm, I'm finding a cold. So to spare listeners any more torture listening to my sick voice, I'm going to step back out of the way. I, I want you to go back as, as far as you want to go back, uh, begin your story, and we'll dive in along the way. I'm going to drink some tea with honey and hope that things work out well on, on, on my end. And we'll listen to you for a bit <laughs> if we can, Brantley. Perfect. Keith. Again, thanks for having me on. You know, uh, like you said, I wasn't exactly sure where we finally got connected along the way. Yeah. Uh, but one, uh, I do remember during my journey when I kind of, and I'll share more about this later, but when I kind of finally allowed Catholicism to be one of the options on the table, um, 
at some point along the way, when I started kind of diving into the Catholic YouTube sphere, um, I came across, uh, I believe it was the, the uh, video you did with Austin Suggs. Yeah, we had yeah, Joe yeah, yeah. and Gavin on. Oh. And uh, at some point <laughs> along the way, I remember watching that and that's where I got introduced to you. And I think maybe around that time is when I maybe uh, added you on Facebook or something, but either way. Um, so it's, it's really is an honor to be on here because you and, and others like Joe and, uh, and, uh, others will probably be, uh, be named, uh, at some point in my story, um, were instrumental in helping bring me into faith. And one other thing I do want to say real quick, I happened to mention to, uh, I was having a lunch with a couple of guys uh, uh, a week or two ago, and uh, just happened to mention that, you know, I was going to be joining you on the podcast. And uh, one of the guys that I've gotten connected to since at our parish, who came into the, him and his family came into the church at the same time, uh, he was like, no way. He said, man, you got to, you know, tell, tell Keith, I said, thank you. Because uh, uh, your channel was a big one for him wow. uh, that mm-hmm. allowed and helped him come into the church as well, man. So, uh, again, truly an honor and thankful for the work you're doing to the glory of God. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That That's amazing. Yeah. I, I I don't know how this is ever happening. I, I don't know what part I play in this and uh, why God is using me as a vessel, but I'm grateful for the time. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. That's, that's so joyous. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Always, uh, and I never know where to start with these things. Like I, yeah. I feel like Dwight yeah. Schrute from The Office. You know, do I start from what <laughs> there was a light, and then all of a sudden I was born, and you know, and then I go from there. But um, what I will say is, you know, uh, you mentioned I don't always do it the best, but I do try in these conversations with uh, our Orthodox Protestant brothers and sisters to be cordial, to be you know. Um, to, to try and have these conversations in the most loving way that I can, because as a Protestant, someone who was up until, you know, I was confirmed at the age of 34, um, was, you know, raised in a Protestant context, uh, specifically a Baptist context with, you know, loving family, parents who, uh, who, you know, did everything they could to raise me and my three younger brothers in the faith. And, um, You know, so I have a very, I'm very thankful for my Protestant background. You know, this is one of the things that I've noticed and I've seen from other Protestant converts who, you know, at least if they were raised in a, in a good, you know, Christian home or a good loving context is that they're very thankful. I'm very thankful for my, my Protestant upbringing because they taught me to love Jesus, to love the scriptures, to love, to evangelize. I mean, one of the things, I don't know how many people are familiar with this. If you grew up in a Baptist context, you probably are familiar with like evangelism explosion where, you know, they (laughs) teach you the formula to ask the two questions to, you know, to evangelize. Like I went to classes, we, we knocked on doors. Like we were going out to bring others in to the, to the fold and to the body of Christ. And so uh, I'm very thankful for my Protestant upbringing in, in many ways um, because it was because of my Protestant upbringing, my love of scripture that grew into my love for theology that grew into my love for church history that eventually led me down the path to where I ended up where, where I am. And so, like I said, I grew up in a, uh, in a Baptist context, specifically a Southern Baptist context, had a, a wonderful pastor, uh, the man that, that baptized me, uh, played a huge role. I won't get into all the details right now, but really with helped in, in keeping my family together at one point. And so, so much to be thankful for, uh, for that. And uh, actually, um, you know, kind of had a lot of the, the normal evangelical Christian story that you hear a lot, you know, where you're raising the church, you kind of have your, your own fire and you go to youth group. I was there every Wednesday night, you know, we're going to the camps. And then, it, you know, at some point along the way, especially when I got into college, Um, I ended up living with a couple of guys, um, that was both a very, not a very good time in my spiritual life, but ended up being an incredibly fruitful time. Um, just briefly, you know, I was not living in any way, shape or form for the Lord. Now I was pretty much going to church still regularly. Um, but my activities, you know, Monday through Saturday were very much diametrically opposed to the way that Christ has called us to live. And, uh, I actually found this out years later, 
that the guy that the the guy that I was living with was two guys, but the the one that owned the house that I was you know renting from, uh, we were good friends. That's you know that's why I was living with them. But he actually told me at one point. He said, man, I actually considered not letting you live there because of how I was living at the time. Wow. And but God pressed on his heart, you know, uh, to, to, to allow me to do so. And it was through uh, he's, a, he's a very sharp, very brilliant guy. Uh, loved the Lord. Uh, he was engaged at the time. Of course, he's now married, multiple kids. But I uh, saw how he loved his fiance. I saw how he loved the Lord. I saw how he lived. You know, when you live with somebody, especially for a year, I mean, you really get to, to know them. And um, seeing how he lived was really impactful for me. And then seeing how seriously he took his faith, how, you know, that was around that time where I became, you know, kind of got into uh, loving to read because he, he read deeply. And so that was uh, that by the end of the year, um, I recognized that, you know, kind of what I meant for evil, God intended for good, and uh, started taking my faith more, more seriously. Ended up going, uh, that year I was took some time out of college, ended up going back to one university, and during that time still continued to grow in my faith. And uh, the Lord actually ended up, uh, I felt pressing on me to go uh, back to a school I'd gone to previously. It's a, a, a private Christian college, and, uh, and go to pursue vocational ministry. And so I graduated... Uh, <laughs> I like to say I was on the, uh, you know, the, the Tommy boy, you know, the seven year plan, you know, it was like a lot of people go to college for seven years. Like, yeah, they're called doctors. Um, but I ended up graduating, you know, about six years uh, from when I initially started college uh, with a theology degree. My wife uh, was married by that time, uh, went to, uh, we moved to North Carolina um, to a Baptist seminary where I was, you know, going to complete my seminary education. Again, going to, with the intent of going into vocational ministry, whatever that looked like. And, um, and yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of my, my background and, you know, to kind of skip ahead just a little bit, you know, just to kind of tell you a little bit about where I was in terms of my thought process about how I viewed Catholics and because around the time I was in college and I, especially when I got into seminary, I kind of started swimming in the more reformed stream. So, you know, you're listening to your, uh, you know, John Piper was the gateway drug for everybody at that time. Uh, getting into Calvinism and Reformed theology. And you know, I was listening to Al Mohler and R.C. Sproul and, you know, um, you know, Paul Washer. I mean, you just Vody Bachum, you go down the line and I was listening, reading, you know, uh, all their material. And those of you who are listening, who have ever heard any of them speak, uh, some more than others, uh, but are very, very much not fans. You know, you're John MacArthur, not fans <laughs> of the Catholic church. Uh, I mean, you know, some very, uh, some very intense verbiage in, in many ways. So, um, you know, I, I certainly saw Catholics as uh, a group of individuals that needed to be evangelized. Um, you know, a, as time went on, I, I was kind of in the camp of, you know, Catholics could be saved kind of if they're ignorant of what they actually believe. That was kind of what, you know, where I stood. It was like, it's possible uh, but really, if it's just kind of a, 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 you know, an ignorance, if you will. And uh, so that that was kind of where I was. Matter of fact, in 2017, I went to Indianapolis uh, and uh, attended the Gospel Coalition's 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I mean, that was wow. that was how locked in I was. You know, I came back with the Luther shirt with the the hammer you know, representing him nailing the, you know, the, the 95 pieces yeah, yeah. to Lord Wittenberg. So that was, that was where I was. And so, you know, I'm sure I made, you know, made jokes and things like that, but I certainly uh, saw Catholics as someone that they needed to be evangelized yeah, yeah. and growing up, you know, in my friends group, you know, no, I didn't really know anybody who was Catholic. I'll say more on that a little bit later, but, you know, um, I had one friend uh, kind of around that time that I, that I met through like a business group that was Catholic and he and I had some very colorful conversations. Um, never felt that there was anything kind of in those conversations that would have pushed me any further closer uh, than I was as far as how I viewed Catholics. Um, it was really during the beginning of COVID uh, when everything started shutting down 
I don't know that there's a correlation. Maybe there was between COVID and when I started doing this, because I was always reading, always reading theology books. Um, but I, you know, as a father, uh, you know, at that time we had, we had just had our fourth child. We had, you know, three girls and just had our son, our son, and I actually named him Spurgeon. <laughs> so if you're wondering how, <laughs> wow. how Baptist I was, wow. uh, named him Spurgeon. No kidding. And, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, to my uh, right over here, there's a Spurgeon bobblehead staring at me. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's 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 where I was. But I, as a father, I, I kind of always kind of tinkered with you know uh, not only just covenant theology, but infant baptism in particular. You know, when I was a Calvinist, you know, you have the Presbyterians and the Baptists, and they're always going at it, right? They they love one another, but they can they can get heated. You know, the infant baptism was always the thing uh, that really kind of made them lock horns and. So I would, from time to time, you know, either listen to debates or read or whatever. And just something in me was like, I need to start taking what you would call, maybe we'd call like the ordinances. You know, I, most of us wouldn't call them sacraments. We'd probably stay away from that language. But you know, things like the Lord's Supper and baptism, I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really dive deep in that again. And the, the first book that I read was a, like a four views book. There's like a series out there where they'll have four views and, you know, there'll be a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, a Lutheran or, or whoever. And they'll talk about a particular topic, eschatology, whatever. And I read a book on the Lord's Supper. And I remember reading the, the first chapter was by a Baptist. It was, uh, he's, he's pretty well known. And I just remember getting to the end of that chapter and I was like, you know, this is somebody whose view I was supposed to you know, pretty much uh, align with. I remember going, that's it? Really? <laughs> you know, and before I even got to the, you know, the, the other guys, what they had to say, I was like, man, something just didn't sit right. And then I got to the, the reform view, I think was the next one. And then the Lutheran and then eventually the Catholic, which I read the Catholic one. I was like, it's wrong. I know that going into it, but I got to read it just to say I could finish, you know, I finished the book, right? Like got to check it off of my good reads. Um, there was something about the Presbyterian and the Lutheran model, just this idea that there is a, there is grace communicated, the kind of a moving more deeply into the kind of the real presence view, although there's a way that, you know, they would define it. That's obviously different from, from we would, what we would hold to. Uh, but something struck me about that. And so I kind of, at that point had moved more into the Calvin's, you know, spiritual presence model where we could say it's real presence, but you know, obviously not in a, a way where we can talk about a sacrifice or transubstantiation or anything like that. Um, so I kind of latched onto that, then moved to infant baptism. And I jokingly like to say that it was a Presbyterian that made me Catholic uh, <laughs> because you know, that was where the ball started rolling. And it, at the initial roll, I had no idea where it was going to land. Um, I, I read a couple of books that uh, helped me better understand the biblical, you know, what at the time we call the covenantal argument for infant baptism. You know, when I saw the connection between, you know, the Abrahamic covenants fulfillment and the new covenant the typology, uh, you know, in Acts 2, uh, you know, you see, uh, St. Peter preaching the sermon, they say, what must we do? And, you know, he repeats the Abrahamic promise, yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that children are still included in this covenant promise. And we see nowhere where the, the covenant sign that is to be given to the children in that covenant is abrogated, you know? So what I always said was an argument for silence on the other side, I quickly saw was an argument uh, for silence on my Baptist side that you would expect that if this was something, if you're a Jewish person in the first century listening to Paul's sermon, uh, excuse me, Peter's sermon, you listen to Peter's sermon and, uh, you know, and he's repeating the, the, the same verbiage, the, the promises for you, for your children, for all those who are far off, you know, your ears are perking up. You know what he's talking about. And for thousands of years, you've always included children in this covenant. You've always given children the sign of the covenant. And so you would expect that if there's going to be this massive reversal where children are no longer a part of the covenant, that someone would say something, right? And then you look at, I believe it's Luke chapter 18, where Jesus you know, says they're bringing even infants to him and he's blessing them. You know, he says, bring them to me. It just seemed odd yeah, yeah. that all of a sudden he would say, bring them to me. By the way, don't, don't include them in the covenant more. Don't give them the sign of the covenant. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, you know, as I was reading these Presbyterians and they're making these arguments, it was one book in particular 
where he first started off kind of with the, the, the historicity of this practice. And he talked about, uh, he actually in the book said, you know, he, he kind of showed the, you know, the, in the Reformation, the covenantal model. And he would, then pointed back to the early church. And he showed examples. He said, look, this was the, the universal practice in the early church. And he, but he gave a caveat and he said, now they did believe in baptismal regeneration, which we don't agree with, but they did baptize infants. We later, you know, I guess he would kind of say like, we're the ones that kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together and figured out covenant theology. They didn't have that yet. They didn't have those puzzle pieces fit together. We do now. But when he said that, it struck me. Just this idea that there was this universality of belief with this one idea, something I was certainly opposed to. Um, so that really threw me into the early church. Um, and so I started reading St. Ignatius, St. Irenaeus. Like, you, you know, you, you go down the line reading what they had to say on this particular subject. And without rambling too long, what I'll say is, um, you know, that, like I said, when that, you know, those, that key kind of unlocked for me, and I started to kind of accept infant baptism. And I was telling my wife, by the way, you know, of course, being married and having, <laughs> going through these theological shifts is a very interesting dynamic. And there's a lot that can be said there about our story. But um, that was where the ball started kind of rolling. That was where the key kind of fit, started fitting together and unlocked how I was viewing um, these things. And I had, but I had no, no concept, no idea that this would end with, end up with me being Catholic. I've, you know, already having been a Calvinist, I was like, well, you know, I was already Googling Presbyterian churches in my area, you know? And um, yeah, so it kind of went on from there, but yeah, I, like I said, with, without, you know, I don't want to run the risk of going on too long. If there's anywhere you want to stop me here and ask anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, why not? It's a great place to, great place to, to pause. I, it's just an interesting way to get into the, you know, the, thinking about these things in the, in the early church, I can remember, for me, it was a similar things. It wasn't infant baptism, but it was questions about looking at at my own, you know, and this is a non-denominational evangelical church. So really, no, we were Pentecostal in affiliation, but loosely held affiliation, right? And so we had very little kind of grounding and denominational backing, looking at other other churches, Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, and this was on the issue of of marriage and gender at this time when it kind of first kind of piqued my well. What do they believe, and why do they believe that, and why do we believe this? And it's it's different, right? For me, you know, for you it's infant baptism. For me, it was the idea of what is marriage, and you begin to realize that other churches that are also Protestant, you know, that that are not Catholic, I guess, disagree. With one another, right? And so then it becomes like you, okay, reading, well, who, why do we believe this? And, and coming up with, with good and, and worse or better and worse kind of answers. And I think you know, that first led me into questions of authority and then eventually through that to, to the early church. But, you know, for you encountering the early church, that's, that's so interesting because you, you then are seeing what the first Christians believed. And I know for me on something like, like authority, you encounter the, the first Christians and realize, wait a second, like they, they were universally believing this one thing that's, that's not what I thought I, I knew. And I guess that doesn't question kind of everything else, right? That you, that you kind of were, were believing as, as, a, you know, as a Calvinist, as a, as a Christian, as a Protestant, you realize that, wait a second, what else did the early church believe that, I, that, that my denomination isn't, isn't following or doesn't believe anymore. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. That, that's exactly right. And I, uh, you know, I, during this time I was having conversations with some people very, I kept the, the conversation, the circle very small, um, you know, people that I trusted and I was, I was talking to them about these things. And one of them was a pastor still talk to them all the time. Love him. It was, uh, he was at one of the campuses of the church that I was going to prior to my conversion. And, you know, as we were having these conversations, they, they in no way, shape or form ever, um, you know, were hostile or anything like that. As a matter of fact, there was one um, Catholic theologian that, that he loved, Matthew Levering. You know, he's, he had tremendous, he has tremendous respect for him. 
And so he was somebody that, you know, while he, you know, would disagree, he certainly wasn't hostile to, to Catholicism. And so as, you know, that ended up kind of being the one thing or, or one of the, the main, um, you know, churches or, you know, traditions that I was looking at, it was kind of a safe place, I guess you could say, to bounce questions off of them. And I remember one of the conversations we were having, he, he, he actually said that he's like, it's like just at the end of the day, it really just comes down to authority. You know, I mean, it really does. All of this comes back uh, to authority. And so certainly when you look back, you know, at the writings of the early church and how they talk about the authority of the church, you know, what is the church? What's the nature of the church? You know, the, the, the necessity of being, you know, we talk about St. Ignatius or St. Clement uh, of Rome and, and having to be united to the bishops having to be united to the bishops who are in a line of succession going back to the apostles, like this necessity that this is where the truth is. Like this is where the truth is. And, you know, so around that time that, you know, I'd accepted kind of, you know, I was like, I think if a baptism makes more sense and I'm reading those early Christians, you know, in those, <laughs> uh, you know, the way that it felt throughout the whole process it was like I just kept taking bigger and bigger sighs of relief. And what I mean is there were passages in my Protestant days, at least within the stream that I was in, because obviously there are going to be denominations that are going to be closer to us than, than other Protestant denominations, yeah. right? Like a high church Anglican, Anglo-Catholic, a Lutheran are going to be in many ways closer on certain things than, you know, uh, you know, the Baptist down the street or the Church of Christ or, or whatever, that you're non-denominational evangelical churches. Um, so sometimes, you know, all these things I'm saying don't necessarily fit perfectly. But, um, you know, uh, you know, as I'm looking back at, at the early church uh, and, I'm lo- and I'm looking at the, the difficult passages that I had struggled with in the past. Like I remember one time someone asking, you know, and I was in these forums and reform groups and somebody asked me a question about, you know, first Peter three, where, you know, baptism now saves you. And, you know, and I was just it threw me for a loop. I'm sure I'd read that passage before, but it was one of those I just kind of skipped over, didn't really catch it or whatever. And I'm, you know, I'm researching, well, what, you know, what do we have to say? And every answer that I was kind of getting the people I was trusting and listening to at the time it's like, it's just, I don't know how this really works, right? You know, and then you have your other passages that talk about, you know, that seem to indicate some sort of salvific uh, efficacy with the baptismal waters. And it, you know, again, coming from a Baptist context, that was really, really hard for me to kind of explain. There, there's, you could read a Baptist commentary and you're going to get commentary on those passages but I, I never found anything that really just made me settled. And when I get, went back to the early church and I'm looking at how their language so closely matches with the, the New Testament writers, you know, Titus, when it talks about the washing of regeneration and you read the early church fathers referring to baptism as the laver of regeneration, you know, you see how they universally interpret John three when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus you know, how they universally interpret, like he's talking about, you know, the water is what, you know, creates this new life within us. Obviously, you know, it's only efficacious because because it is God who's doing the work. You know, it's just the instrument that he's utilizing. And but again, so as I'm reading the church fathers, I'm thinking like it's I, I'm like, I don't have to I'm not to use my puzzle piece example again. I'm not having to take, you know, a corner piece and, you know, trying to mash it with another corner piece, you know, I'm able to fit it together much more neatly. And uh, that was helpful. And, you know, I brought up, you know, uh, Anglicanism, you know, as I was going down that path, that's kind of where I was headed because, you know, I'm seeing all these things. Okay. They're talking about real presence. They're talking about baptismal regeneration. They're talking about, you know, the necessity of bishops and apostolic succession and, and all these things. Um, but to get back to what you were saying earlier is precisely was the, the term that I often use the pebble in my shoe, if you will, was this yeah. idea that as the culture, and we all feel this as the culture is beating against the, the doors of the church, um, as you're seeing denomination after denomination splitting and fracturing over and over again, 
uh, because of all the issues that are going on outside the church. They're now infiltrating the church. And you're seeing this constant just spiraling off of one another. Um, you know, I, I was almost pretty set that I was going to become Anglican. So again, I was Googling Anglican, you know, churches around me and I'm looking at their particular diocese or who they're partnered with. Um, and I was already noticing some things that I was like, ah, that's not good. And if they're already here on this topic, where are they going to be in a year, two yeah. years, five years yeah. from now? And the biggest thing uh, was, again, you know, if you remember, like all of this really started out from a fatherly pursuit. Me as a husband, yeah. as a father, I have children. Am I supposed to be giving them, you know, am I supposed to be, am I, do I need to have them baptized? Right. Do I need to be, if this is something that Christ instituted, do I need to be obedient? Do I need to give my children, you know, do I need to bring them to the font? You know, do I need to make sure that they're baptized? And so it started from a fatherly pursuit. And so as I'm looking at these things within you know, the Anglican, and by the way, I mean, you know, I have some, I've met some wonderful Anglican uh, friends that I still, you know, one of them, you know, I'd, I've never met him in person, but we're incredibly close. You know, I'd say he's a dear friend of mine, truly. Um, and he, he's truly just a dear friend. And so I, I have much, much love uh, for all my Protestant brothers and sisters. But, um, but I, but again, I just noticed things. I was like, you know, if they're already here and I am bringing my family and I'm going to have my children baptized at this church, like, I don't want to in two years or five years have to move my family somewhere else and just kind of keep playing this thing where I'm having to hop around um, to find a place where the ground is firm and settled. Yeah, yeah. And so that was really where it got to. I was like, is there a place where the foundation is settled? Like, is there a place where for 2000 years, uh, you know, the, the, the culture has never infiltrated the church's dogmatic teachings, where church teachings, what that which it is defined as truth, uh, has, um, you know, has capitulated to the culture. And what I eventually realized through reading and studying was that that was the Catholic Church. You know, I looked really hard at the Catholic Church, at, at the Orthodox Church, um, but really it was, you know, ultimately, you know, the biggest hang up that I had was the papacy, but that was also. Uh, the nail in the coffin, if you will, is the thing that did me in. Um, because at some point I recognized that if the papacy is a divinely instituted office, um, then I could point and say that is where Christ church is. Um, that, that is where it is. And, you know, anybody listening right now that knows anything about what's going on, what has gone on in the past and what's going on, you know, there's always, there is always going to be um, challenges that face the church, the Catholic church, right? Like there's always going to be turmoil. There's going to be infighting. But the reality is, and I actually think it may have been Joe Heschmeyer that said this. I can't remember if it was on your show, but I remember him saying, I believe it was him, that each Pope to some degree has less authority. They have this, they have this, they have the same keys they're in the same line of succession but you can't have a rogue Pope come in and just undo 2000 years of church history. Right. I think Eric Ybarra one time said that, uh, you know, a lot of people see the, uh, they, they think the Pope, you know, whether it's Catholics or non-Catholics, they think that, you know, he's this figure that's going to swoop in on a, sh you know, a chandelier and just start, you know, whacking away and, you know, you know, fighting this person or undoing this teaching, whatever, like he doesn't have that kind of power uh, the reality is, is he's there to help as well, along with the magisterium to safeguard the deposit of faith. And from everything that I've seen, there's never been a moment where something has been dogmatized that um, that uh, goes against what has come before. And there's nothing that has been undogmatized that, you know, so that was where I thought, you know, there's something to this. There's something to that sense where, you know, look. You know, there's going to be difficult times. You know, if, if people think that what's going on right now is bad within the church, like you better thank God that Facebook and Twitter didn't exist <laughs> under some of the popes, you know, yeah. you know, one of the Alexanders or whoever, like it, it's, it's, it's been bad before. And yet because it's Christ church and he promised that the gates of hell would never overcome it. That's why we're still here. 
And um, so, yeah, that, that really was the biggest thing for me is if I'm going to bring my family into a tradition, into a church, like I want to know one, that this is the church that Christ instituted. Uh, and two, that, that again, you know, there are going to be outside influences. They're going to be, there's going to be turmoil. The ship is going to rock, but ultimately if we are on the ark, uh, Christ is going to bring us safely home. Yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty big reframing, I think, that there is a church, like a, a true church with a, a pope as, as the head that Christ founded, a, you know, a single church. I know, for, for, I'm sure for you, for me, as a, as a Protestant, there were in this, this invisible body of Christ, right? So we were in, in our church as non-denominational evangelicals, we were part of the body of Christ. And so were the Anglicans down the street and the Lutherans that met in the building after our service were also part of the body of Christ. But then if you talked about, you talked about verses and, and puzzle pieces that couldn't fit before, right? Because you, you push that too far, it, it falls apart, right? You, you get something like, I think it's Matthew 16, where Christ talks about how to solve disputes, right? And we'll bring it to the church is what is mm-hmm. the final answer. And the question becomes, well, well, what church? Because I, I just solved this dispute in my church, but the church over here has a different answer. So if I don't like this answer, I can, I can go over there, right? And someone like Dr. John Bergsma, I've had in this show, a Catholic convert himself, a pastor of a church, you know, hit that passage and thought, well, what, as a pastor, what do I do with this kind of passage? Because it seems like I should have ultimate authority in my church to, to solve issues. But if people don't like my solutions, they can leave, they can leave my (laughs) church. And, you know, as a guy in the pew, that's one thing as the pastor, that's a whole other can of worms. Right. So I wonder how did you make that shift from understanding that, that the body of Christ is this invisible group of believers to no, 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 there must be an actual, an actual church there. Like what was that shift for you like? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, Dr. Bergs, I mean, there were so many, I love Dr. Bergsma. <laughs> I love, of course, Dr. Han, you know, I mean, he's, you know, he's Han Solo, right? Like he is, <laughs> he, he, you know, there's no telling how many, you know, he's brought into the church. Oh, One thing I loved about Dr. Han, uh, doc, you know, Dr. Bergsma is they spoke my language, right? Yeah, they came yeah, from that, yeah. that reformed background, that Calvinist background. And, uh, and so that was great. So the passage you mentioned, you know, Matthew 18, right? Like take it to yes, the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was one of the things that I recognized along the way is, you know, I couldn't find in scripture, couldn't find in the early church where there was this notion, you know, especially coming from a, a Baptist background. Again, this kind of gets back to what I said earlier. You know, one thing that I say, you know, will apply to maybe one denomination. It's not going to apply to, to others, but there was no sense where there was like these autonomous churches, right? Like, you had Antioch and they were completely, you know, separate from, you know, the, the, the church in Asia Minor or, you know, Jerusalem or whatever. Like they all saw themselves in communion with one another. And you see that in the New Testament. There was just no there's there's nothing that we see that indicates in any way, shape or form that there were that the early church was fractured in some way between where well, you have this you know, group in Jerusalem, they, they kind of believe this about, you know, the, this sacrament or, or, you know, this theological belief and the, you know, these over here, they, they believe this. And so they were united. You know, one of the passages that stuck out to me is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's not multiple yeah. faiths. It's not multiple truths. Like the church is the pillar and the bulwark of truth, like the truth. There's one truth. And so could I say that there is one truth when we're all separated on what I would argue are pretty serious uh, subjects in many ways. Um, But yeah, so getting back to Matthew 18, you know, and you mentioned Matthew 16 as well, both those passages uh, were huge for me because they started talking about binding and loosing, right? Like, yeah, what does yeah, that mean? Yeah. What does that mean that yeah. the church has the authority to bind and loose? What does it mean that the church has the authority to discipline? Because like you said, yeah, I could do something stupid or, or all of a sudden shift theologically. And the pastor at the church I'm at, it says, you're out, you're excommunicated, right? They're, you know, they're going to stand on Matthew 18 and say, we are, exe- you know, we're executing church discipline. You know, either you change or you leave. Well, there's a church down the road. I live in the South. So there's a church on every corner right next to, you know, Waffle House. And so, you know, you know, I could just go down the church down the road, you know, and no more discipline until I mess something up there. And, you know, I could just church hop. 
Um, but there was a real sense, you know, in scripture, in the early church, that to be outside of communion with the bishop, to be outside of the apostolic tradition, the apostolic faith, you are placing yourself outside of the church. There's no sense in, there, there was no sense where, you know, St. Irenaeus or whoever goes, okay, well, you have that theological opinion. Well, you're just no longer part of our community. We're going to borrow you from communion. You, but you can have your church over there. Like, that's perfectly fine. You know, whatever. It's like, no, you're outside of the church. And and so that was a big thing for me. And like I said, with the binding and loosing, uh, you know, people, of course, like Swan Asona, you know, uh, who I've you know formed a, a great friendship with and <laughs> so thankful for, helping me understand what that meant. Like, yeah. what does it mean that the church has this authority, this interpretive authority, this disciplinary authority? Um you know, this ability to dogmatize. And we see it in scripture. <clears throat> we don't have to wait till 325 until the Council of Nicaea. Like Acts 15, like we see a serious theological dispute arise. One thing that I thought about, I remember the first time I kind of re- reread that passage with this understanding of the authority of the church. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at it, I'm going, okay, you know, they, they you would you would think right like f- from the, a lot of the ways that you know you hear things like well the apostles just taught what Jesus taught them okay well when you get to Acts fifteen you would expect when you know you're having the the Judaizing controversy of whether Gentiles should be given the sign of circumcision you'd go well they should just go well well remember guys Jesus said don't do it anymore they didn't say that right like but they had to come together you know you have uh, Saint Peter standing up and says, you know, gives his opinion on the matter. You have the testimonies and then you have St. James. You kind of say, hey, you know, Peter said it. Here's what I'm saying. You know, and they say it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. And they make the the binding decision. And so that's why when you get to Galatians 5 and and St. Paul is just reaming the Galatians, you know, he could do that, yeah. right? Because he's saying, guys, we've already decided on this matter. This is what the church decided. There's no, well, we have another opinion. Because the thing that I thought about with the Judaizers in some ways, you know, especially before the the, the Council of Jerusalem, like you can empathize with them, right? Because prior to this, when Gentiles were, were, were included in the covenant family of God, you know, they were given, you know, the males were given the sign of circumcision. You had pros- proselyte baptism, you know, before then, you know, they were circumcised, they were, they were baptized, you had this ritual cleansing. So they're like, hey, you know, we're baptizing, like this all seems familiar to us. But we're just, we're just doing what we've always done. And Gentiles are like, you know, of course, they're, you know, like, hey, man, we, we don't want to do that. Please don't, you know, let's not do that. Understandably so. And so they had to come together and make this decision. And again, it wasn't a decision that, you know, because, uh, you know, again, people are like, oh, well, the Catholic Church, it's an authority of man. It's man-made traditions, man-made, you know, it's, it's men making interpretive decisions or whatever, which in a, in a sense is true. Yes, it is men doing it. Uh, but as they said, it seems to go to us and to the Holy Spirit that, that you know, when Jesus said that, uh, in Matthew 16, you know, um, you know, whatever, you know, door you open will be open, whatever door you shut will be shut. Uh, whatever, you know, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, right? Like these decisions have been ratified in heaven. And so, and again, you see that played out in Acts 15. And the church just seems to have this, after the the, the final, you know, uh, the closing of the canon, if you will, I know it wasn't settled at that time, but, um, you know, the church all of a sudden has this strange recollection that this is to continue on, right? Like, when you get to the Council of Nicaea and, and they make their, their dogmatic decision regarding the, the Trinity, um, you, you, there's, there's no sense where it's like, well, you know, guys, this is just our best guess. You know, it, this is open to change later. Like we can, you know, if it kind of, if we figure something out it's later, you know, we interpret it differently. Like it's, you know, it, we can, it's like, uh, you know, cause what I would say is a Protestant often, you know, somebody who, who kind of dabbled in the, the, what we call like the confessional streams, you know, your, you know, your Westminster confessions and your London Baptist confessions. We'd say, well, these are good documents and in some way they're binding documents if you're going to remain in this stream. Uh, but they're only true in as much as they agree with scripture, which of course I would say that about, you know, our councils and things like that as well. 
But these councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, of Chalcedon, like these are binding councils. Like there's no, well, I inter- I just interpret it differently. Uh, that, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go start my own community. People did that, but they were labeled heretics, <laughs> right? They were schismatics. And so, um, like I said, when you, you see this continue on in the life of the church, the same thing that you see Christ promising, the, the binding and loosing, the authority to make these decisions, to discipline the church, um, you see this same thing taking place in Acts and later in the early church. And nobody's saying, guys, like this, that was, about, that was just the apostles. That, yeah, that yeah. died out with them. No, it was a continuation because they saw their ministry being an apostolic ministry. Yeah, I think that for me was also so shocking, Brantley, that 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 can right. And you mentioned before, you know, carefully rereading things like like Matthew eighteen, Matthew sixteen, these these verses that you'd read and you'd kind of, I don't know how I ever honestly thinking back now, I and mean, I've been a Catholic for for terribly long. I don't know how I read Matthew 16 before, you know, the binding and the loosing and, and, and understood that it was okay with that. I think there are the, these verses you don't really quite see, or you're reading them through your, your already fixed lens. I think it was Jimmy Aiken I had in the show a while back that talked about how, how we pass on tradition and, and the Bible, right? And somebody literally gives you a Bible at some point, you open it and you read it. Like it's literally that tradition is literally passed on Mm -hmm. and you, you read that in the context you're given that. Right. So, I mean, I became evangelical at the age of, uh, of 15 or so in high school. And I was, I went and I bought a Bible and joined my friends, you know, Pentecostal church. And I guess I, I read that Bible in the context of, churches that are part of denominations, that are post-Reformation, that believe these different things, that are part of an invisible body of Christ. I didn't really question those kind of things that, that I inherited when I became Christian until I began to read like you know the early church fathers and encounter these things and realize that, wait a minute, what I thought was the norm for Christian belief and interpretation actually wasn't the norm until you know just 500 years ago, right, for example. So I think those are very, very shocking kind of paradigm shifts, but it it begins with that kind of closer reading, and then you see that wait a minute, everybody is is living, you know, in this continuous stream from the, from the time of the of the go- the gospels through the epistles, and then right through the early church, it, it, it's assumed by those first Christians. This is how it operates, and that kind of carries on, and it was the Reformation that that broke away from that, and then we just kind of. You know, we're born into that and inherited that until you begin to question that kind of that 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 paradigm because of some kind of pebble in your shoe, right? Like infant mm-hmm. baptism or something that, that that begins to to force you to look more closely at that. But it's it's kind of crazy how it is right there you know, in the early church, continuous from the gospels. Like that that binding and loosing doesn't go away. It's practiced continuously in, in the early church yeah. up up through to today. Right. Yep. A- absolutely. And uh, you know, one of the things that so you know, in my Protestant days, I'd read uh, Saint Athanasius's On the Incarnation, and there's a there's a version of it that has an uh, an introduction by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And I tell yeah. people all the time that I'm like, the introduction alone is worth the price <laughs> of admission. It it, it's I mean, it's Lewis. So, I mean, it's it's fantastic. <laughs> and I think one of the, the one of the things that he talks about in there is chronological snobbery, because I think a lot of times we think that the older is primitive in the sense that we've now learned more like, and there, of course there's a sense where, you know, we've, you know, doctrine does develop, right? Like, you know, that's why the church makes these decisions as time goes on, um, you know, because new challenges arise, new heresies arise. And so we have to come together and, and we see the development of that doctrine. Um, you know, one of the things I love, um, uh, you know, Pope Benedict said in, in uh, one of his books is, he says, a lot of times we'll see people confuse uh, the acorn for the tree. We look, you know, they're like, oh, we need to go back to the, you know, they'll start house churches because they're like, we need to go back to what they did. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you're confusing the the acorn for the tree. You need to see what it's blossomed into. Um, but he talked, but Lewis talks about chronological snobbery. 
And so that, that, you know, that always stuck with me for years. And so when I started investigating the early church and somebody, I actually had somebody tell me one time, like, no, we do know more now. Like, you know, that's why I'm Protestant because we know better than they did. Right. They were wrong on those things. We're right. But I was like, you know, if, if I were to, if I were to, to write kind of my life story or, or stories about my life or, or whatever, and you were to read it, uh, you know, most of the time it's going to be pretty straightforward, but if there are things in there, they're confusing. Or you're like, man, I'd like more context on there. This doesn't make sense. And my wife and my children, if I've died and they're still alive, like, wouldn't you want to ask yeah. them versus yeah, other yeah, people yeah. who have just read the book and maybe are, are also some, confusing some things. And so when you read the early church, that's the way I saw it. When you talk about St. Ignatius, who is, you know, a successor of, uh, you know, he's the Bishop of Antioch and he's the successor of uh, St. Peter, who was, you know, a Bishop in Antioch at one point. And he was St. St. Ignatius is a uh, contemporary of the apostle John, same for St. Polycarp, who then discipled St. Irenaeus and St. Irenaeus, who talks about how, you know, he's like, look, I'm just telling you what Polycarp said, who said that, you know, these things are, you know, the teachings of John are ringing in his ears. You know, it's like, you know, I, you mean to tell me that I get to read the people that knew the apostles that were taught by the apostles or were taught by somebody who was taught by the apostles? I can read what they said. And then they're all saying on a lot of these things, they're saying the same thing. Like, who am I to argue? You know, why would you argue with my children and my wife about, you know, about what they saw from me? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like they live with me. Like, like, you know, so that was kind of what I thought is like these people live with, you know, some, some that we have, uh, you know, extant writings from live with the apostles. Not only that, these people were dying for their faith, right? You know, you read the list of the first 30 popes and I mean, my gosh, like how many of them were martyred, you know, for their faith. Like these were, these were men, uh, these were holy men. These were pious men. These were men who uh, loved the Lord and, and had an in- intense desire. It doesn't take long reading their works to see this intense desire to preserve the true faith. And, and so when you read what they have to say, you know, when you read uh, St. Ignatius talking about the, the, the reality of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the, the fact that you need to you know, stay away from those who would deny that it's the flesh of Christ that we receive in the blessed sacrament. When you see the, the language of sacrifice being utilized for you know, the mass, uh, when you see the, the constant reminder that, look, if you don't have a bishop, you don't have a church. If you don't yeah. have a bishop, yeah. you don't have a valid Eucharist or somebody that has, you know, that he has appointed to, to preside over the Eucharist. I'm like, like I, I don't know how I fit that in my Baptist college. Yeah. What do you mean yeah. valid? It's, 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 a, it's a wafer and Welch's grape juice. Like, what do you mean it's valid? It's, it is what it is, you know? And so um, when I saw that language, when I saw how they talked, when I saw that they, these were you know, pious men that loved the Lord, were doing everything they could do, uh, could do to preserve the apostolic faith, when they were telling others, hey, you know, you know why we can reject your faith, you know, whatever you're teaching? It's because you can't point to a bishop going back to an apostle yeah. that's teaching this same thing. Um, so that that was really big for me, you know, being able to see those who were, you know, in the early church and what they what they were talking about at the time. I mean, again, these were persecuted people. So, you know, they don't have time in many ways to just sit around and pontificate. Yeah. Like what they are saying <laughs> yeah. is vital to us. And what they're saying is Christ is present. It's the sacrifice. It's the inclusion of infants. It's baptismal regeneration. It's you know, the necessity of being on what they would call the Ark of Salvation, the one Ark, the church, um, you know, and I could go on and on and on. But that was what struck me. And I mean, quite honestly, you know, along my journey, that was when I knew I was I was in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that was that was powerful for me. Yeah. Well, that's so similar to, for, for me and my journey too, Brantley. I remember I got to a point where I was like, well, where else? where else can I go? Like, it looks to me like there's, there is this authoritative structure that was set up that carried on and, and kept going. And there's challenges and problems along the way, but where else can I go? But 
what Christ founded. And I, I think for me, I, I sat for a bit in the question of, well, okay, look, the Catholic Church, like I, I see the Eucharist in the early church. I see infant baptism. I, I see uh, communion of the saints. I see these Catholic things. But, but I also see problems, right? I, I see problems in the church hierarchy. I, I see the, the need for, for reforming, and, and, I, and I saw some value in, in the Reformation. And in my, in my Protestant faith, with the, with the Bible as the source at this time, but then I thought, okay, but I can't, I can't have a belief in, in, in the Eucharist and infant baptism and communion of the saints and just chuck out this authority thing, just chuck out the, the bishops, right? And there's this, this sense of trying to sit in, in, in pieces of this, taking pieces of the early church and saying, oh, well, I, I, I can take all this stuff, but I don't want to commit to the authority of the church because it got corrupted along the way somewhere. And so that, that part of it's not, not, not valid anymore. But then it began to search, maybe you did too, for, well, where could this corruption have happened? And you, know, you, you see the Reformation happen, and you see the Reformation happen in response to some things that aren't great in the church. But you see the church fixing those things, <laughs> like right away, in the Counter-Reformation. Saints like mm-hmm. St. Francis de Sales, one of my absolute favorite saints of all time. It's my confirmation the, saint. The, the patron of this, this show, my friend, the patron saint of this show. Beautiful. You, you, you don't see, or I didn't see, a, a moment where the corruption is so bad that that promise that Christ promised that the church would not be overcome, that promise isn't, isn't valid anymore or, or is somehow, mm-hmm. somehow broken, right? I, I, I couldn't see that. So I had to say, okay, well, maybe I don't get all these things. Maybe I, I still am uncomfortable with some of the scandals and the, and the messes of the church, but I don't see where else I could go that has that authority claim that that runs right back to the apostles themselves that the Catholic Church, you know, you know, seems to have, right? I I couldn't just pick the 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 practices, the liturgy, and leave aside the authority part. I had to become mm. Catholic in in my view. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. No, it does. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's probably one of the biggest things that um, that I like to to tell people that I'm having these conversations with them like. Look, you know, people just assume that Luther was the first one that called for reform. Read about Giles of Viterbo. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like before Luther ever nailed his thesis to the door, whether at that time, and I don't think he, he did know kind of where it was all going to go. Um, but, you know, before he ever did that, there was already call for, you know, correcting the abuses that were taking place for a, a true reformation in the church, a true yeah. renewal of getting back to uh, what the church already had, had, you know, founded as, as the truth. And, you know, um, basically just putting, putting into practice what was already there. And because they understood something, which is if this is the church that Christ instituted, if it truly is, uh, and even Luther, there's, there's a quotation where he talks about this. And of course he later, you know, uh, kind of m- moves away from this, but he talks about it. He's like, there's no doubt. He says that, that, uh, that God has a special favor on the, the Roman church because it has the popes. It has the martyrs. It has the miracles. Like he names up all these things. And he says, no matter how bad things get, essentially, he said, it, it, it's all the more reason to cling to it. And I wish that Luther and others yeah, would have, yeah, would have, yeah. would have kept that. And that's what you see in people like, Giles of Viterbo. It's what you see in St. Francis de Sales, like I said, who's my confirmation saint. Um, you know, and, and by the way, just as a plug uh, for his book, I don't think he's worried about getting the royalties anymore. Uh, but as a plug for his book, uh, The Catholic Controversy, everybody, Catholic, yes, non-Catholic, absolutely. should read it. it. It is phenomenal. But they understood that no matter how bad the corruption in the church gets, Uh, It is no reason to leave the church. It is all the more reason to borrow Luther's language, to cleave to it, to cling to it. And they did that. And those abuses were corrected. Um, You know, I mean, people often, and I get it. It's, it's hard to defend some of the things that have taken place or are taking place. I get it. But I've read the old Testament. I've read what God's chosen people can get up to and it's not good. Right. (laughs) But God is a covenant-keeping God. When God covenants with his people, when he establishes his church, when he promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, 
then no matter what's going on inside the corruption that's taking place as tragic and as terrible, and we need to call for renewal and reform yeah, when that yeah, does happen. Yeah. But we don't leave the church. We cling to Christ's church. And that was the biggest thing that I kind of recognize in looking at that, that period is no matter what's going on inside, outside, we stay on the ark. When things get rocky, don't jump into the turbulent waters and stay on the ship. It's the safest place to be, you know? So that's, that's, that's kind of what I recognize. So yeah, any, anybody I would recommend, you know, read the counter reformers, like they, they were calling for reformation, yeah. but they understood that this is the church, right? Like this is the church. Yeah, that was deeply shocking for me to encounter in St. Francis de Sales for the first time in the Catholic controversy. I read it uh, poolside uh, in, in Costa Rica. We were on a baby moon. I, I dropped it in the pool, got all wet and destroyed. <laughs> and I took that copy and I got home and I gave it to my my pastor, who is a good friend of our family, you know, married my wife and I, I've known him for years and years. I gave it to him and talk about a book just landing flatly. He kind of, he read it or says he did at least, read it and kind of went, yeah, I, I don't get the big the big deal with this. And I kind of went, what, what, wait a minute, you, you, you don't? I realize now that you know, people are on a journey, right? You can't hand them a book that you that you read at the end of your journey, expecting them to resonate with, with that, you know, at, at the beginning or not even begun their journey. But it's one of the things that, that he says in there, right? Like j- just questioning the idea that, well, how can you, you know, you know, reformers just go and start your own church. Like, whose authority are you doing that by? And you go, well, yeah, right? Because no one had was doing that, right? You you see in the early church and all the way up through the, the Middle Ages and in all of church history, you see people starting churches on the authority of, of an apostle, right? Of a, mm. Or apostles ordain them to go and start this church, right? We see that in the Gospels, in the epistles, and that continues on. No one's just beginning churches of their own volition until the Reformation. And, there, and the counter-reformers, when that was happening, right away were going, hey, whoa, 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 stop, guys. What, what are you doing? Right now, we take that for granted in the Protestant world that, of course, you just, I, I feel called by God. I'm going to start a church or a denomination or, or, or whatnot, right? Mm-hmm. But that was a novel thing. And, you know, 500 years ago, that was a novel thing. So that really, for me, made me question my whole foundation at that point, right? Like, wait a minute. This, this model of, of doing church is essentially 500 years old because before that, Nobody was doing that. And the counter-reformers called out the shenanigans of those first reformers. Wait yeah. a minute, how, how can you do that? Right? Oh, 500 years old, that, that's not very old, right? <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I saw a, a reel today that I don't, I don't think it was supposed to be funny, but it made me, <laughs> made me chuckle a little bit. And, uh, and again, this come a place I, I deeply love my Protestant yeah, brothers yeah, and yeah, sisters, yeah, but, yeah. but it was a... Uh, it was a, a beautiful cathedral, beautiful cathedral. I can't remember the name of it. It took 632 years to build. And, some, and, the, and the caption was, this is, long, this is longer than Protestant, or this is older than Protestantism, or it took longer than Protestantism. And I was like, that, that's kind of funny. But that, but that, that did strike me. Um, and, and I think that sometimes people rush to that too quickly, you know, just, oh, well, you know, it's 500 years. But I, I would say there is something to it. I think we, we need to have the data or the reasons to back that up, which people like St. Francis de Sales provide, which is to say, you know, there's immediate and immediate mission, right? Like Christ commissioned the apostles, the apostles commissioned, you know, the, the bishops and those who would carry on the faith, you know, uh, who commissioned you, yeah, yeah. right? Did, did, did God come, did God give you some special revelation that you were all of the sudden supposed to start your own thing. Okay. Well, if that's the case, where are your miracles yes. to, to show that this is the case? <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. If you don't have those, all right, then which Bishop told you to do this? Oh, they didn't. Okay. Well, then what are we doing here? You know, of course <laughs> he doesn't say it that way, but I, uh, you know, it's like, well, what are we doing here? And uh, I keep referencing them. But I believe it was, again, I think it was, and I know it was a conversation that he and Gavin, Joe and Gavin were having. And I only think they've had conversations on, on your channel, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, but I remember Joe posing this question and to Gavin's credit, he kind of was like, yeah, I mean, that's a good thing to ponder. But man, it, it struck me and I was like, that's a very interesting question. 
He says there, there, there's, of course, more than two things, but two of the things in Scripture that it says, uh, if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. One is uh, if you're a heretic. Uh, the other is if you're a schismatic. When the Reformation, um, essentially the, the argument of the Reformers in, in many ways is the church has been so corrupted by heresy and, and uh, you know, accretions or whatever you want to call it have been so corrupted that we can no longer be a part of it. To remain in communion with that church is to be complicit, and essentially you yourself are a heretic. But to break away from this church that they would, you know, admit or some would admit that was at one point was the church that Christ instituted, is to say that we have now schismed from this church. And what Job essentially said was, would God ever place his people in this catch-22 yeah, situation yes, yes. where if you stay, you're a heretic, which you know, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if you remain knowingly that you're a heretic or, or in communion with heretics. The other is to become a schismatic, to break away from this church. And so it places you in this catch-22 situation where you can't win either way, both ways God says you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And it's hard for me to fathom that God would ever place his people in this impossible predicament. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's very well said, Joe and or Brantley. I I love that. If I remember that correctly, (laughs) I think you're right. That sounds very familiar. And of course that is such a powerful you know, question to pose. One that was posed to me that's, that's similar is the idea that why would God make uh, the the truth so hard to find. Okay, if sola scriptura is the model for how we know how to be Christians, when you when you get to an issue that there's division, why would God make it so hard to figure out what the truth is? If we can both look at the same passage and be you know prayerful Protestants, we can we can pray on that. We can ask the Lord for guidance. We can we can we can fast. We can you know go to the highest mountain and 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 some sort of monastery of some kind and just for years just wait and wait and wait and still disagree. You know, two very holy men can still disagree on these things. Why would God make it so hard to be a Christian yeah. if, if that's the model? Right? That doesn't seem like the like a loving God would establish a system like that. Right? Which is absolutely. Yeah, and, and that was one thing, again, that I, I kind of, um, you know, played out in my mind, wrestled with. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking in my own head. A lot of times out loud, I probably look weird when people pass me in the car and I'm talking out loud to myself or in the shower or whatnot. I have a lot of conversations with myself. But that was one of the things I had to work out, um, you know, because I think a lot of times we get so caught up in our 21st century Western mindset you know, we're in the technology age. Information is literally at our fingertips. Um, we, we have access to, you know, especially if you're part, you know, if you're Protestant, like I was, um, I think these things are beautiful. I think they should happen and, and, and should happen more within the Catholic Church. You know, things like Bible studies where we're getting together, we're studying the scriptures. Uh, because while the Catholic Church, of course, has dogmatized many things that are essential to the faith, they haven't dogmatized, you know, everything, you know. We can still talk about and you know argue, if you if you will, uh, about these things or, or, or talk about them. So you know we we study the the scriptures, but we we sometimes forget that uh, you know if you're living in the first, second, third, se- I mean, and on and on and on before the printing press, like you don't have access. Yeah, there, yeah. there's no Bible studies going on. You know, I mean, you had to be wealthy just to even own a copy of one gospel, you know, let alone an entire New Testament, uh, they weren't readily available. And so Christ instituted a church to be able to feed his sheep. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, the, you know, he, he gives St. Peter that charge. Uh, he gives the other apostles that charge to the, the handing on of the keys, which are passed down to, uh, the, the bishops and they're in charge of, of, of shepherding the flock of Christ. And so, you know, we just assume that that's how things have always been, right? People are just yeah. digging in and studying the scriptures, yeah, figuring things yeah. out. But the reality is that just wasn't available. I mean, you think about uh, there's there's one guy I love his, uh, you know, I love this uh, this term he's coined. Uh, it's uh, medieval have a medieval grind set, and what he means by that is 
you know, sometimes we can bury our heads. I'm not saying we should do that, but sometimes we can be so wrapped up in all the controversies and everything going on that we just experience this ecclesial or spiritual anxiety. We're just like, I don't know what to do. And the reality is if you're like a farmer in the, you know, in the, during the medieval (laughs) period or whatever, you're just like, I got to feed my family, man. I got to go to mass. I got to receive the, I need to go to confession, you know, but, but really I've got to, I've got to work in the field, man. Like I've got to be out there. Like I'm not getting wrapped up in what's going on at the Vatican. I'm not getting wrapped up in all this stuff. Like I'm, I'm trying to provide and take care of and raise my children in the faith, you know? And so like, you know, during that period and, and of course in the early church, like people just that that's what they were doing, right? Yeah. Like they didn't, they weren't able to, they weren't even able to, if they wanted to just sit around and read scripture uh, like that. And so that is why Christ lovingly gave us the church. That's why he lovingly gave us the Holy scriptures yeah. as Dave Arabum talks about, you know, the, the magisterium is there. Sacred tradition is there uh, to, um, to support the Holy scriptures. Like they're there to support the sacred scriptures, to make sure that they're upheld, that they are protected, that they are safeguarded. Uh, Because what happens is when everybody kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of gets their grubby paws in. And what I mean by that is in a lot, you know, we're we're doing it out of a good heart (laughs) in most cases, right? Like my, my Baptist brothers, my Presbyterian brothers, my Anglican brothers, my Lutheran brothers, like they're not going in with evil intent, but You know, when you put a particular set of glasses on and you're viewing it through that lens, it's so easy to see like, yeah, you know, this this theology makes sense. Uh, Or, you know, and then you put the other lenses on and go, okay, well, this this kind of makes sense, too. Um, But the reality is Christ gave us a church, uh, you know, for for hundreds and hundreds of years when people weren't able to study the scriptures and have all these conversations like the church was there to lovingly teach and guide the faithful. And so, again, getting back, I mean, I truly love my Protestant brothers and, and the love that they taught me to have for the scripture, because ultimately that was what led me to become Catholic, because I took the scripture seriously. And I'm seeing the things and the, the, the passages along the way that, that caused me to have those troubles, um, I found were uh, preserved and best explicated in the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. Look, I I'd love to ask you one more question if if you have time because you sure. were you your wife you and your wife married as you were looking into vocational ministry as a Protestant. So I'm yeah. so curious how you and maybe this is a whole other show. I don't know if you have time you have time to explain this briefly for your own sake. I don't want to keep you up till midnight. But how how did that how did that unfold when you guys married kind of on the basis of, okay, I'm looking into vocational ministry and suddenly, you know, years later awaits, oh, we got to become Catholic. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, l- l- let me first start with saying uh, that I'm very blessed and I'm very thankful uh, because this isn't everybody's story, right? Yeah, they convert yeah, or yeah. it takes them longer to convert because they have a spouse who, just isn't on board and it's, and it causes a lot of tension in their marriage. You know, I mean, I say that it took Dr. Han four years before yeah, his yeah, wife yeah. came in and I'm like, Dr. Han, man, come on. You know, it's like if anybody could convince their spouse, you know, it would be him. And, and thankfully, of course, they have a beautiful story and she did, but, but I'm, I'm, I feel truly, truly, truly blessed. And, um, you know, as I explained earlier, I was already on a big theological journey, even if I didn't end up Catholic, like if I stopped short and became Presbyterian or Anglican, like that was already a big shift. And that was probably one of the biggest things. It was tough for my wife. Cause I'm already going like, as I was like, okay, I think infant baptism makes sense. We already knew we couldn't stay at our current church. Like they, they weren't going to baptize our, yeah, our children, yeah, our, yeah. our young, you know, young children. Um, they were going to wait till they were old enough, make a profession of faith, that sort of thing. And so we already knew we were going to make a change. And she knew how, <laughs> how anti opposed to the Catholic church already was like, she knew that. And so I remember the day that I came to or the night that I came to her, cause I was spending every night this before we had our twins. So I had a little bit more time in those days. <laughs> uh, I was just pouring over books and pouring over the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. And I remember walking over to her, she was sitting on the couch and I just said like, basically something like to the effect of I'm putting it on the table. 
like I wasn't saying that I was, I think I'm becoming Catholic. It was like, I'm, I, I'm, this is a viable option for me now. And her response was no, 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 no. <laughs> like, like she was just like, that's no, it's, it's too much. She's like, I, I'm, I'm tapping out at this point, you know, but, um, I kind of knew I, I needed to be a little patient and pray. I mean, I was in the whole time I'm praying for myself, constantly praying for myself, like, because I had this tremendous weight and responsibility knowing like, yeah, I yeah. once believed that this was a church that, you know, anathematized the gospel at Trent. You know, this was a, this was a false church and, and all this kind of stuff. And so um, I was, you know, now that I was considering, I'm like, I may be bringing my, my family into a false church, possibly if I do this, you know, I, I wouldn't do it knowingly doing that, but it, but, that that's what's on the table here. And so I was praying a lot and, and now I'm praying for her. And, you know, one of the things I did was I would just kind of continue as, you know, as much as I could, as you probably have seen tonight, I can ramble. Um, so I kind of would, I was patient enough to watch the moment or start, her eyes would start to glaze over and I would stop, but I would share with her all the things that I was studying. And I just remember she would say like things like that, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense. And I remember one night, I'm not a crier, but I remember one night that, that all, almost uh, had me in tears, if I remember. I don't, I don't remember crying, but I, was, I could feel it welling up, is when she said, uh, when I was just like, I, you know, kind of like the moment I was like, I think I have to do this. She's like, Brantley, I, I trust you. She's like, I, I trust you. And man, like as a husband, I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that got me. And yeah. I, and I've already knew what a wonderful woman I married. I mean, she, I've always said from the moment I married her, like she is the ultimate picture of God's grace in my life. She is the tangible visual evidence of no matter how dumb I am, you know, she still <laughs> loves me. And so in my Christian, you know, my, my, my walk with Christ, no matter how dumb I am, Jesus is still there with open arms. And so, but when she said that, um, that, that was huge. And, and she had her own journey. I mean, it wasn't at that moment. She was like, everything makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm still learning stuff. I mean, I'm, you know, only a year and a half into being confirmed. And so I'm, you know, I'm still learning and growing, but, and we'll do that to the day that we die. Yeah. But, um, you know, but she had her own journey, you know, Mary, Mary, the Mary and dogmas were a big, big thing for her. And it just like, it just doesn't make sense. Like why it's just, you know, coming from process, it's like, I love Jesus. Uh, you know, why do I need to yeah, add all yeah, these extra yeah. things? And like, like why, you know, but we talked about it, you know, she read and, uh, and then Mary, you know, the blessed Virgin Mary ended up being her confirmation set, you know? So, uh, it was, it was beautiful, but, um, but that is one thing that I've said over and over again that I love is that, you know, um, I, I, I didn't leave behind in many ways, my evangelical ways. Like I just yeah. embraced the fullness. I got more. Yeah. We got the communion of the saints. We got a loving mother who loves to take, our prayers to her son. And, you know, we, we, we got the sacraments, we got confession, which I am unbelievably <laughs> thankful for. Um, I remember listening to a debate one time with Peter D. Williams and James White. And I remember him saying at the end, which I thought was such a poignant uh, uh, point, which is, you know, I don't know how a Christian goes their whole life without committing a moral yeah. sin, you know? And, and I was like, amen, brother, you know, cause I mean, you know, so um, I'm thankful for the sacraments. I'm, I'm thankful for the the tangible, visible evidences of God's grace in my life. And uh, so it's been great. It's been, I'm so thankful that she came into the church with me, um, you know, because now we're on the same page with how we're raising mm -hmm. our children. We're on the same, you know, our, uh, our oldest two right now are in their in their sacrament classes. And so we're getting to, you know, we, we pray the same prayers together. We're, you know, so it's it's been beautiful. So I'm truly thankful that we we were able to come into the church at the same time it was uh it was a joyous moment yeah and that's hopeful for lots of listeners i know you know for us it was a year between uh me coming in and my wife coming in the following easter and there was some tension in there there's some times where i thought for sure she'd never convert right and and over time and mostly me being quiet and praying like uh, that that shift and that change and i know for me the time when I thought, oh, something's happening here. It was when we were actually at a, a marriage counselor uh, talking about, you know, we, we began this, that, that journey in counseling together because I was converting and she wasn't. And we were like, well, how do we 
keep our marriage intact and raise children like this. We were, we were seeking help from a counselor. And it was at that counseling session that she began to, and the counselor kind of pushed back a little bit on my, on my, my thinking. And she jumped to my defense and go, well, they can't just believe this. And, and, and here's why. And I went, wait a minute. You're, 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 you've been listening. Now you're defending my views. <laughs> you know, and she wasn't converting yeah. at that point. That's when I realized that, okay, the Holy Spirit is moving here. But it's hopeful. It's hopeful for listeners that are on that journey that think, well, my spouse never will convert. Or how are we ever going to make this work, raising family uh, of mixed, you know, Protestant Catholic? How is this going to, to be a successful and fruitful marriage? And, you know, for us, we were on the same page uh, faith-wise our entire and you're dating in our marriage, and you, know, you guys were too, right? It's a scary thing to suddenly, potentially, be on different pages. But I think I, I appreciate you know your your story, your journey. You know, I, I have my own, and I'm hopeful that listeners will 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 find hope in that, right? That that God is not going to l- strand you, I guess, in in becoming yeah. Catholic, right? And who knows what that will, will look like in in every different relationship? But it's, gosh. You, Seeking after that truth, uh, there is, you know, there, there's souls in that. There is, it, it is a truth, and, and God knows what you're going through, right? And, and what needs to happen. I don't know. It's still scary. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and it was tough for us. I mean, this, is, this would be a, another whole episode, but, you know, it was, uh, it was a challenging time. You know, when I came, yeah. came time to tell my family, and it was very difficult, you know, and it was, it was stressful, but, um, the, the reality is, is that it was all worth it. And, you know, I, I don't have the perfect answers. I don't have a silver bullet for someone who's in that situation where they're now kind of an interfaith, you know, uh, uh, you know, interfaith marriage or, you know, where they're got one's Protestant or one's Catholic or, or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I don't have a, a silver bullet answer. I wish I could give, but the biggest thing I would say is obviously uh, be patient, continue to have those conversations. You know, don't, you know, don't beat it over your spouse's head. Um, the, and the biggest thing I would say is to live out your faith. I mean, I think one of the greatest witnesses um, is to be faithful. And like I just mentioned, you know, we now have the beauty of the sacraments. Like, I, you know, we have access to the Eucharist. We have access to confession. We have wonderful devotions like the rosary and you know, uh, you know, I think I see you've got an icon behind you. I've got the San Damiano cross behind me and uh, icons and that, you know, like th- these things that we incorporate, the liturgical living that we now uh, yeah. partake in. Yeah. Um, I-, I would say that make sure that, that we're, at, you know, that we're utilizing, uh, you know, the weapons, if you will, that, w- that we now have access to in the church to live out our faith, because there's something captivating and something beautiful about it. You know, I remember as a Protestant, when I was still firmly Protestant, uh, I remember tweeting out one time, like, why, you know, because I love aesthetics, like I love art. I just remember, why do Catholics get beauty right? Like, I remember that, like, I, I said it kind of joking, but in a, like a frustrated way, like, you know, we're, you know, guys, for the most part, we're kind of terrible at this. Like, the Catholics get it right. Like, but I think there, there's something alluring. And, and that's, that's the point, right? Like, we're not, yeah. we're not doing yeah. laser yeah. lights and fog machines to, to, to play on emotions. Like there's something about the beauty that is drawing us in and drawing our eyes upward to heaven. There's something, uh, you know, we recognize that at the mass, it is heaven on earth. And so to getting back to what I was saying is, you know, you have those tools, you have those weapons. We have the beauty of the church, like make sure that you're living out the faith. That's probably one of the best witnesses, uh, to it. Because like I said, You know, my wife's like, oh, why do we need Mary? Like, why, you know, why, you know, we ask these questions. Why do I need to ask the saints for this? Why do, why do I need all this stuff? Uh, we'll show them, you know, yeah. Yeah. show them. And I mean, we, it, it's amazing now that we have this great cloud of witnesses that scripture talks about that are cheering us on. And so we need to utilize those things and, and invite others, whether it's our, our friends, family, spouse, um, to, to see that, you know, we're not, I'm not cuckoo cuckoo for cocoa puffs, right? <laughs> like I, I like the, the, it's, it's, you know, I'm living this out. It, it's changing me. It's making me more and more in love with my savior. Mary, the saints aren't distracting me. They're pointing me to Jesus. Yeah. yeah. I love cocoa puffs though. So just for the record, <laughs> yeah. 
Big fan. Uh, Bradley, this has been an absolute joy to talk to you uh, on the podcast. I'm so grateful. I'm sure listeners will as well. And I know you're the kind of guy who just loves people to reach out to you. So I, I can, yeah. I'll put whatever social media links you want in the notes for this show. People can reach out to you and ask their questions and wrestle this through with you. I know you're the kind of guy who loves to accompany people on that, on that journey. And uh, thanks. Thanks for being here. I want to say God bless you, uh, your family, the the work you're doing for the church, even if nothing else, the having and raising of six kids to the glory of God, Brantley, that's amazing. And twins, that, that gosh, the move from four to six at once like that, to me seems scary. So God bless you, <laughs> you and your wife. Thank you, brother. In that journey, man, that's amazing. And honestly, thanks for being here today. This is a real pleasure. Absolutely. Again, thank you for uh, for everything you've done. Thank you for having me on. Uh, just as I reiterate, you know, I said at the beginning, I reiterate now, you know, obviously your show was uh, helpful for, for me and obviously a uh, convert that I know that came in at the same time. And so, uh, you know, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. You, you do. You have some wonderful guests. I know I'll kind of be the outlier. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but man, thank you uh, for having me on for sure. Yeah, you're the worst. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Bradley. Hi, brother.